The Nation Network presents Coming in Hot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Coming in Hot. I am Brent Wallace alongside 13 year NHL veteran. 757 games, Jason York. Welcome to the show. But now you get to enjoy the private, retired life of playing golf in November. <laughs> what a day yesterday, too, Wally. 20 degrees. I think we got 22 on Saturday. Unfortunately, got to head to Toronto tonight to see my son play at UAT. So I think the golf season might be over for me. Uh, and so do you want to uh, dis- – who's your playing partner? Yesterday? Oh, yeah. Uh, played with a couple old friends. Uh, one, one gentleman who's going to be inducted to a special shrine. Uh, what is it? Just over a week from now, Wally. And I think yeah, he might have shot five, five under par as well. He had a pretty good day. Got him in my pocket for a few bucks. But, uh, yeah, no, Alfie played a good game yesterday. So, um, yeah, not. it's never a bad thing when you lose to a guy that shoots four under. Uh, before we move on to the show, you quickly, like, You've you've hung out with Alfie all year. You used to be neighbors. Do you guys still tell stories back in the day? Do you just do you, do you still talk about the old days? Absolutely. That, that's that's the best part of being a hockey player. Everybody thinks it's all about. Obviously, the Hall of Fame is one thing, but yeah. it's all about the stories. It's all about the dressing room, talking about guys. A, a name will pop up, and just and you'll make fun of that guy for some of the quirky things he used to do, and. And some of the stories on the road after games. Honestly, as far as my career goes, a little bit different career than Daniel Alfredson's, I can remember maybe three of the goals I scored. My first NHL goal, scored it on Fred Brathwaite, a second from Steve Eiserman, pretty cool. Three Nepean connections on my first goal. Right. And I scored a couple of time winners. And besides that, it's 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 becoming more and more of a fog to me. But if you want to hear a story, something funny, something that happened after the game, I, my memory is as clear as daylight. So, and that's the way it is. That's that, and that is the great thing about playing sports. Doesn't matter what level, it's the, it's the stories, the camaraderie, and the friendships you make. Ah, awesome. Well, maybe we'll get Alfie on sometime. We'll talk about some of those stories. Um, as always, the coming in hot show brought to you by Renfru Pro Tape. Uh, they are the ones with the green core. Uh, by the way, they are. You can find them in all the leading retailers, Pro Hockey Life, and entire um, Sport Check, all that. They also are the ones who uh, make the HDA tape, uh, and they're hottest sellers right now. By the way, Yorkie, this is probably because of you buying it all up. As the flame tape, uh, they can't keep it in stock right now. They're telling me. I'm not sure why, but everybody loves the flame. Tape. Anyway, I'm now I'm now changing the slogan of presented by to this show is held together by Renfrew Pro Tape because that feels more appropriate. I like it, Wally. <laughs> uh, let's get right to it. There's uh, the Auto Senators have played 10 games, so we're going to break down the first 10 games. And to do that, I welcome in our good friend, as always, from The Athletic, uh, who has about 19 jobs, and that is Ian Mendez. Thanks for finding some time for us, sir. Yeah, listen, and let me, let me uh, for, for people who are watching this and not, and not just listening to the pod, uh, I'm populous because my, my, my poppy, I, think, I don't know about you, Brent, but I you always leave my poppies in like in the glove compartment so that I have, you know, spare ones, right. In case you know, you're putting on a coat and you don't, anyway, long story short, I don't have my car here right now. So I'm populous. Well, so as a reporter, I used to travel in my bag every, uh, how every Halloween, every November with a yeah. full bag of poppies. So a uh, true story. We're in Philadelphia. This is the Jacques Martin era years ago. Uh, Steve Keogh was the PR guy. They happened to come to me like, we forgot the poppies. Do you have any? I'm like, yeah. I outfitted the entire coaching staff because I had so many poppies. But see, you got to trade that for something. You got to trade that for, okay, I'll give you the poppy. You give me the next sit down exclusive with a You got to use that. You got to use the currency. I know. I, I didn't think of it. Well, maybe because I'm just a good guy, Mendez, and I don't always go looking for stuff, apparently, like you. Yeah, I don't think so. Hey, by the way, can I jump in on this? Uh, and I, and I, I missed it. I was just fiddling around with the speakers. So, Jason York, you say you only remember three of your goals, right? 
pretty well, give or takey. And I remember the first one, I remember, I remember an overtime winner I scored in Nashville, and I remembered an overtime winner I scored against the Boston Bruins. Uh, and also, too, I scored on, I scored, here's one for you. I know you're a stats guy, Ian. I didn't yeah. score a lot of goals, but I did score on Patrick Waugh, Marty Brodeur, and Dominic Hasek. That's not too bad. I'm going to take that one to the grave with me. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. So here, okay, here's the question. I looked it up while you were speaking. I, I have Hockey Reference, which is a great tool. Who's oh, the only uh, Who's the only team that you scored two goals in a game against? Uh, maybe the Philadelphia Flyers, the New York Islanders. No, yeah. or the Boston Bruins. Was it? Was it yeah. Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. I, and I don't remember the I don't remember the goals. I re, I remember that somebody told me that a while ago, but I I cannot. And I've got a pretty good imagination of visualizing visualizing things for the life of me. Ian, I'm drawing a blank on both those goals. Okay, your first goal. It's a power play marker for Marion Hosa and Radic Bonk in the first period. Got nothing. Not, not help. Nothing. Got nothing. Your second. I got goal? nothing. <laughs> Early. Early in the third period, this clearly was some sort of checking situation. Colin Forbes and uh, Vinny Prospel set you up for a goal. Okay. If you want me to tell you at least two or three nicknames for each guy, I can help you out on that one. Colin Forbes loved to have haagen ice cream before every pregame, so I started just calling him haagen He had a soft ice cream body, too, so we would give it to him. Every pregame buffet... We'd be all over Colin Forbes because he was just a, like, bud, we got to play a hockey game here. Lay off the ice cream. So I could go all day about Colin Forbes, and that's a pretty obscure Ottawa Senators reference you made there. You, you want me to talk about his how he played or some of his goals? I got nothing. But nicknames, stories, I'm your, I'm your guy. Love it. Sorry, Wally, I didn't mean to hijack your show by no. asking uh <laughs> maybe, yeah. you know what maybe you, you can help going. with the rundown next time um by the way jason york sits 20 uh, ninth in uh auto center defenseman scoring for goals with 25 so that's a lot to remember actually Beauty. um all right let's huh. let's get to the Ottawa <laughs> senators first 10 games of the season shall we brought to you by bei bonisher excavating inc they are the leaders in construction in the Ottawa Valley. BonisherExcavating.com. They will help with uh, your landscape needs or aggregate. 613-432-1120 or go to BonisherExcavating.com. Remember, slow down in construction zones. Bonisher Excavating, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Uh, all right. Um, big game last night. Although, I sat at this game and watched it get to 4-1, then 5-1, and the crowd was completely out of it. And it just didn't feel like Ottawa was ever going to make the comeback until the very, very end. Ian, will you break down what you saw last night? Well, I'll tell you what. I think, you know what's frustrating? Is you look at three of those goals, and they're the direct result of an egregious turnover by an A-level player for Ottawa. Not like a fringe guy or somebody whose nickname was Hagen dazs Like, this is a, this is a <laughs> top-end, high-end guy that is playing meaningful minutes. Shabbat on the first goal on Stone, right? Uh, Stutzla on the on the power play a little bit. We'll call it careless with the puck high in the other zone. And then Debrinket with – it was just – DJ Smith said after the game, look, it's a weird one kind of off the heel of his stick. But if you look at it, I think on the whole – and, and I felt like I was worried that this was going to happen to Ottawa. I thought at some point they're going to outplay the other team and they're not going to get the result. And that's kind of what happened, right? Like I, I don't I don't think they were bad yesterday, but I just think – you can't be that loosey goosey with um, with the puck, and it ends up in the back of your net, uh, you know, multiple times. And and you're right, you, you, you the odd time they came back against Toronto a few years ago, right? Down five one, you might have one of those in in your bag of tricks every five or six years. It, it's not a recipe for success. I didn't I didn't hate their game, but given what we were talking about going into that game, the need to protect the puck, be smart. 200 foot game. I didn't, I didn't love some of those things that, that I kind of pointed out. Yeah. yeah Ian, I, I, I think there's certain games and, and something you said right there about 
you're worried there was going to be a game come where, where they really outplayed the team. Well, that was the game. And, and I have no problem with the, the effort. Um, if you look, this team is still working hard for DJ Smith. You watch these guys work. Um, I think early in this game, Thompson made a couple really big saves in the game. And, and, and by no means am I, am I going to say that Ottawa lost this game because of goaltending, because they've had really good goaltending this year. But I think the puck just came on the wrong guy's stick a couple times. It was G Gambrell. I don't know if you guys remember this. He had two great opportunities early in the game. V Vegas was asleep to start this game. They were sloppy. They made a ton of those egre egregious turnovers you're talking about, Ian. But the difference is when, when Vegas made those mistakes, Ottawa didn't capitalize. And early in a game, when you have a team that's struggling, and again, I'm not going to pin this on goaltending, but I would have liked to have seen out of those five goals, maybe maybe stop one that you're not supposed to stop. And and those are the types of saves you need when you're really struggling. Like the carrier goal, for example, great goal. Could he have stopped it? Is he supposed to stop it? If he does, maybe it's a different game. But um, one good thing I'll take out of that, guys, well, there's actually three good things. The, the effort... Uh, I, I really like the, the, um, the bounce back by Sanderson as well. I thought Sanderson struggled yeah. earlier, but a, but a great sign. Did he ever pick it up in the second part of the game? I, I thought he was arguably Ottawa's best player in the second part of the game. And, um, and, and number three, I really liked Cam Talbot. When he came in the game, I know the pressure was off and you've already given up five, but he made some big saves. He actually gave Ottawa a chance to win that game in the third. He made a couple really big saves, and he was really calm in there. And when you got a guy that's calm, a veteran, body language, it really it really settles down your team. And uh, I, I think he's going to be really good for this young team. He's going to calm down that young group of defensemen back there. Is Talbot going to do? By the way, it was for those who don't know, uh, Cam Talbot's Ottawa Senator debut last night is he's missed the beginning of the season. Um, is he going to do what Craig Anderson did for this group potentially then? And, and that is bring that veteran guy in the, between the pipes and settles the group down when they're a young core. Well, I, I don't know what you think, Yorkie and, and even you Wally, but like, I kind of thought that that was what we thought Anton Forsberg was, right? Like I, he's a, bit, a little bit older and he's brought a ton of stability to the crease. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just look at Anton Forsberg's game on Thursday and think, Oh man, this guy, he has been even in those games in Florida, uh, they had no business being in some of those games. Anton has been good. I I do think, and what I like about DJ Smith on Thursday morning is he talked about, look, there's no excuses here. Like, so I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that we're playing without Artem Zub, who's a top pairing defenseman, without Josh Norris, who's a top end center for our team, and without Cam Talbot, who is supposed to be one of our 1A one, one goalies. But I do think that... In the absence, and this is what Yorkie hit on, in the absence of a little bit of confidence and structure, that's where your goalie can steal you games. And sometimes you just need your goalie to, like, go back to the other night, that Tampa game. Did Andre Vasilevsky have any business making that save on Drake Batherson? Like, it kind of, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes you just need the, the little save at the right time that just, yeah. and they didn't get it last night. And you hope that Cam Talbot can provide it. But it's like, he's got to jump in here. I think the problem for Cam is, uh, you know, he didn't really get a preseason. He got a little taste of action last night. And now it's like, oh, by the way, uh, come on in on Saturday against Philly. I don't mean to say this, but the season's kind of on the line and and go. Right? That's kind of how it, it kind of feels right yep. now on, on Cam Talbot. Well, so it. panic button's pressed already. I love it. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I'm it was. Hovering. It's hovering. <laughs> it's hovering? I, I felt like. Your hand's yeah. just hovering above? My hand's hovering <laughs> over. I'm not. I'm not pressing the button yet. I don't know. I think it was pressed a couple of games ago when they were, you know, in on in Tampa and in Florida. Listen, let's take a look here at the ten, after the ten game mark of where the stats show how Ottawa has played compared to last year. So they have one point more than they did last year at four, six, and zero. They've scored more goals, which is what they expected. They've given up actually one more. The power plays a little, both the same. Penalty kills a little better. Goals against is higher. Safe percentage is lower. Minimally, I should say. So they kind of look the same as last year. Were we not expecting a better team after 10 games this year, uh, Ian Mendez? 
Yeah, we were. And I, and I think, you know, DJ said uh, prior to the game against Vegas, he said, look, our goal was we wanted to be five and five after 10 games. And and part of that wasn't him saying like, that's our, that was our ceiling. That was, I think, that's the, 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 the minimum expectation was we were playing uh, Boston and Washington and Dallas and all these teams. I think he said, that, and if I'm not mistaken, it was eight teams out of the first 10 that they played that made the playoffs last year. The only two that they played that didn't make the playoffs were Buffalo and Vegas. And, you know, Vegas is arguably, okay, they weren't a playoff team last year, but I think they were pretty good. You saw it again last night. They are a pretty good team. So I think I wanted to see them be five and five at the very least. I Here's what I think. I think the next 10 games are going to tell this, the real story of this team. There's no more excuses. And look at the teams that they're playing. Okay, look at the teams that they're playing right now. Um, you know, they're 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 playing um, Philly, Islanders, Vancouver, Philly, Vancouver. Uh, These are teams in their weight class, right? Well, I don't know. The Flyers are playing pretty good hockey of late. So, uh, mm-hmm. Vancouver, Vancouver's now won what three in a row. Then they've got new. They go to New Jersey. They go to Philly. Then they come home to the Islanders, Buffalo, New Jersey. Right. And then they go on that West Coast trip which is the American Thanksgiving. And that's where they all, the barometer is, right? If if you're going to be in the playoffs, you got to be there by American Thanksgiving. That is a tough, tough grind for the Ottawa Senators coming up in the month of November. So, Ian, you said something you said there, the the 20-game mark for the Ottawa Senators. Oh, you got some news there, Wally? I will get to you in a sec about this. Keep going. Okay. Well, something you said right there, Ian, about the 20 game mark, that's a really important mark for it's when you evaluate your hockey team from your, your, your players, what your needs are, what's, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, coaching. It's really important for a lot of things. And I know everyone was saying there's pressure on DJ Smith. There's, pre- there's pressure on everybody to, to win this year. And that, that, that was said in the summer, this team wants to be a team that's going to be a playoff team. So 20 game mark is real important because if this team is not where they're supposed to be at the 20 game mark, there'll be yeah. some changes because there, there's some pressure right now to win. And the fan base expects it. You made moves. You brought in Claude Giroux. Uh, you brought in Debrinket. Um, and, and so far they, they've been okay. Um, but if you want to look at last night in particular, what was besides I said, timely saves. One of the reasons they lost that game, had trouble defending poor defensive decisions especially from your defenseman if he zub is in that game he makes a huge difference the other thing couldn't score early in the game well you got your top goal scorer from last night last year out as well in josh norris when you're when you're young when you have injuries it's much harder to withstand versus an older veteran team like the boston bruins like everybody say, well, how's, how's Boston winning? Because they were missing guys early. They had no McAvoy. Uh, they had no Marchand, but they were able to win some games. It's, it's just different because they're, they've got experience. The Ottawa Senators don't have a lot of experience. Uh, obviously, Cole Giroux's there, but besides that, it's, it, it's pretty slim. So you've got guys in a lot of positions they're not used to be in. I'll say Thomas Shabbat, for example, guys. Wally and I were chatting about this uh, off camera the other day. Tell me a meaningful game that Thomas Shabbat's played in his career to date. A meaningful yeah, game a- where, the, where yeah. the pressure is on and you have to win. Because this team has been playing under the radar. Yeah, we're young. We're not really supposed to win. We're rebuilding. Um, but now all of a sudden, hey, let's go. It's time to win. And, and there is a different pressure when you are expected to win. And I've been on teams where you're not expected to win after the game. You know, the coach comes in, he's mad, but at the same time, expectations weren't there. Expectations have changed now for the Ottawa Senators. Like it or not, it makes some guys sometimes do things you don't normally see when they're playing because there's real pressure on having to win there right now for the Ottawa Senators. And some guys can deal with it, some guys can't. Oh, I was just letting Ian talk. Uh, oh, I will yeah. say, I, and I've looked this up, uh, Thomas Shabbat's in his seventh season, over 300 games, yet to play a meaningful game, if you will. Kachuk, 
five seasons. Batherson, his fifth season. Stutzla, his third. Anton Forsberg, his eighth season. He's never had a playoff game and never really been in any kind of meaningful games like that as well. They need, correct me if I'm wrong, we've talked about bringing in a top 4D. They have Claude Giroux, so I will say they have some veteran, along with Nick Holden, if you will. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they have the, the right mix of people to try to teach them what it takes to get to meaningful playoff game, meaningful games and into the postseason. I, I could be completely wrong, but I, I just feel they don't have the mix. Okay, well, here's a question for Yorkie then. Um, because you were around, right, when, when Ottawa made the playoffs that first year in 1997, yes. right? Which was a great yeah. run. And, and you can see the mm-hmm. similarities, right? Good young core, kind of just coming of age. Like, who are the guys mm-hmm. you le- – like, was there anybody in that locker room that you felt like down the stretch – played an important role kind of off the ice and kind of just saying, hey, guys, this is what you got to do to win games when there's some external pressure. Randy Cunningworth, easy answer right there. Randy Cunningworth had was a guy that was on the back nine of his career. Uh, he was late 30s, but, man, this guy played the game from the tips. He was the captain of the team back then, and he had the respect of the locker room. And I'm not saying they don't – like Brady Kachuk, I watch him play – Absolutely no issues as far as leadership, playing, leading by example. I think he's a great captain. He's had a great start of the year. But in our particular situation, Cunningworth was the guy. Because we were young. And you don't always have to have a, a team of, of players that uh, is able to – hasn't played meaningful games, like I said. But this team, different team as well, guys, because it, we were really, really young. Like you had Red and – that just came into the league. Phillips that just came into the league. Alfie was just starting to get going. Uh, we, had, we had Yash and guys like that. But Cunningworth was a very important veteran because he really set the, the locker room for expectations, how we were supposed to work and practice. And this guy too, like he was 35. He dropped the gloves and fight too. And we remember one game in particular, there was a skirmish. Cunny jumped in. I think somebody was uh, messing around with Alfie or Yash. All of a sudden, Cunny comes flying in, just beats the piss out of this guy. And right there, we're like, that's why this guy's the captain. And he just had ultimate, he had immediate respect from the locker room, just little things like that. But but that team, and also too, I know this word gets thrown a lot of ton out there, the word structure. Don't forget, we had Jacques Martin back then. And that team couldn't afford to play loosey-goosey hockey. We weren't good enough. So we practiced the little things, and we never beat ourselves. Didn't turn the puck over. At the blue line, pucks were always put into places where you wouldn't get hurt defensively. Kept the shots down low. Um, and we just never beat ourselves. So we hung around in a lot of different hockey games. And also, too, remember, you could clutch and grab back then, too. Like, I was a master at the octopus in the corners. Like, I was grab guys, hold on to guys. And, like, it was it was just different. Like, and similarities, too. Like, Hosa was just coming in. Havlat came in a couple years later. Um, so I do see the similarities. But we, we played a different style. We played, I'll call it Jacques Martin hockey, guys, uh, which is basically you never beat yourselves. And when you play that way, uh, your your percentages of winning really go up. It's boring hockey, though. <laughs> well, but I disagree with you, Jason. And I know you played, so maybe I'm wrong. But uh, the Ottawa Senators led the league in scoring a couple of years, if not one, if if not two. It wasn't boring. They just happened to ch- stop you in the neutral zone, and then you're the other way, and you're scoring five goals a night. They it was. Yeah, that was late. I still think it's exciting when you're winning. Yeah, that was. I remember that. I remember that team you're talking about, and Jacques kind of adapted how he how he was coaching. But don't forget, a lot of those younger guys had matured and and were were sure. really good players. Like Marion Hosa on that team when they were right up in the scoring, like he was arguably not arguably he was he was the best two way player in the game. And you had guys like yeah. that that were very sure of themselves. The thing when you have young players early on in their career. You got to teach him structure. You got to teach him how to play the right side of the puck. And, and I'll give Jacques full marks. There's a reason Marion Hosa became one of the best two way players in the game. He had Jacques early on in his career, and he taught him how to play the right side of the puck in a 200 foot game. Sure, he had those qualities in him, but but coaches can really go a long way to, to help guys like that. And yeah, it's not, 
it's not boring hockey. It's I call it high percentage hockey. That's how you win. That's 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 what playoff hockey is. And and right now when you watch Ottawa, they're just they're just making too many big mistakes, and those mistakes are ended up in the back of the net. Yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence that Marion Hossa, Zdeno Chara, and Daniel Alfredson are all Hall of Famers, and they all had Jacques Martin at kind of an impressionable moment in their career. You know, I think he kind of laid the foundation for what they would become later yeah. on. You know? it, and, and I'll throw another so, name out early. Uh, sorry, Wally. There, and you'll remember this name, guys. A guy we had early on in Ottawa was a guy by the name of Craig Ramsey who was a pretty good defensive forward for the Buffalo Sabres for a long time. Yeah. Rammer was the guy, Rammer was the guy that, 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 that really got into Marion's ear about how to play the game the right way. You talk to Sean Van Allen, who's now the coach of the Carleton University Ravens. Rammer was brilliant. And he was, he was a big reason why a lot of these forwards turn into very good defensive forwards. Craig, Craig Ramsey was a su- great guy, but what a smart hockey man he was. He was in it. So let me put this to you then, Mendez, uh, even Yorkie. Yep. I don't know how this works or fits because Jacques Martin is uh, a consultant with the Kingston Front and actually OHL. Would, would it work if they brought in Jacques Martin as a consultant to put structure in or uh, under the coaching system with DJ and with Jack and with uh, Davis Payne and whatnot, it just wouldn't work because it's another voice. So Mendez, would you bring in Jacques Martin to settle out or – or sort out the structure. You know what? And, and, and Yorkie will will have a much more kind of nuanced, intelligent answer, and just in terms of the dynamics of what goes on <laughs> behind the room. Whereas you know, guys like you and I, Wally, we're on the outside looking in. I would feel yep. like the time to do that was in August. Like, you want to bring them in, bring them in. Like, bring them in and help create the structure that you would use throughout training camp. The the language, whatever it is that you need to establish, you do it then i think if you all of a sudden parachute a guy in now in the middle of november 10 games into the season it is going to create i don't know what if his philosophy meshes with the head coaches and right. like you know what i mean so to me if you're going to do something like that you got to change the whole thing out now i'm a believer in give it to tw- I, I have always said i want to see where they're at after 20 games after 20 games i think it's fair game to assess everybody on on the staff and where they're at um but i feel like that it could just end up being a little bit confusing. And I think that if you were going to do that, you should have done it at the end of August. So you have it at training camp. But again, I, I'd be curious to know if York, if you ever had a situation where a guy all of a sudden in the middle of the season, they go, oh, by the way, here's our new defensive consultant. And it was a new uh, kind of fresh voice. <laughs> no, no, that's basically what you're doing is you're basically telling your coach, he's going to be fired soon. <laughs> and this yes. guy's going to be taking yeah. over something like that. It sounds great on paper, but Ian, I totally agree. If you're doing something like that, you do it in the off season. But this team already has enough guys on their coaching staff. Jack Capuano is a former head coach. You got you got DJ there. Davis Payne's a, a former coach as well. You got Bob Jones. I I, I don't think coaching's the the problem with this team. The, just the players are just making poor decisions on the ice. Like structure is a very overused word. Um, Look at these mistakes. It's off the rush. Like last night, off the rush, defenseman leaving the middle of the ice, just making decisions that lead lead to lead to glaring mistakes. And unfortunately, All right, hold on, wait a second. Day. Wait a second. They can't keep got? making the same mistakes for three straight years and then you say it's just a player issue. They have to then teach this to the players. So I said this the other day, what did people think were going to happen with this team? The summer of Pierre was a great shopping list. They went out and got Debrinket. They got Drew. Everything looked really sexy out there, right? Everybody loved it. What's the biggest problem with this team right now? Defense. Who's the best defenseman on this team right now? It's Jake Sanderson. Jake Sanderson is the best defenseman on this team right now. Uh, Two-way player. How many, how many, how many games has Jake Sanderson played in the league so far? Ten? Yeah. Ten. Like the the issue with this team is the blue line should have been addressed in the summer, and it wasn't. You can't win consistently in the NHL unless you have a solid group of defensemen. And, and if we go through this group right now one by one, 
He got Thomas Shabbat, played in the league. We've already said so far he hasn't played a meaningful game yet. Lots of talent, like the player, is a legitimate defenseman. Then you got Sanderson. He's played a whopping 10 games. You got Nick Holden, who I think he was waived by Vegas. Good player, great 6'7 guy. You got Zaitsev. Well, everybody knows what's going on with Zaitsev right now. You got Hamannick, who was waived through the entire NHL. Nobody wanted him. Now he's with the Ottawa Senators. And hey, he's off to a good start. And you've got Eric Brandstrom, who's a smallish type defenseman, defending issues, but he's off to a nice start as well. Are you telling me you're going to win consistently night in and night out? I don't care how good your structure is. That's going to be tough in today's NHL, especially with the matchups and who you're playing against. This blue line should have been addressed in the summer. It wasn't. And now you're seeing what's happening because of it. Plain and simple. You know what? And I think just to, to, to kind of piggyback off that, when you go and you look at the standings, and, and New Jersey is a great comparable, right? Because they've got that young core of guys. And I think a lot of Ottawa fans are looking at the standings and like, why can't that be us? And if you look at New Jersey's save percentage from their goalies, they're one of the worst uh, goaltending tandems in the league right now. They're getting sub-900 save percentage. But you know what the Devils are doing better than almost anybody else? They're dominating the game and possession time. And I think their revamped defense is a big reason why. Think about in the last 15 months, the Devils have mm -hmm. gone out, or whatever it is, 18 months, they added Dougie Hamilton, Ryan Graves, and John Marino. Like, mm -hmm. you completely overhauled. Like, and I know people want to say, oh, wow, uh, you know, Jesper Brad is, is going off. And he is. And Nico Heischer and Jack Hughes and all. Trust me, they're all been great. But what is the biggest difference between the Devils you see today and the Devils from a couple of years ago? It's that structure. Mm -hmm. It's that quality on the blue line. Marino and Graves and Hamilton. And all of a sudden now, you're, you've got, you know, three pairs. Go look at the ice time that they're playing, too. Nobody's playing more than 21 minutes. It's all mm -hmm. with, between kind of 17 and a half and 21. There's no ma major discrepancy. Someone's playing 27. and so, like This is what the, the thing is with New Jersey, is, is I think that they've created a really comp, uh, competent and stable back end. And then when you look at Ottawa, as Yorkie just pointed out, uh, there there's some question marks there that are still lingering. And, you know, on some level, I guess we shouldn't be overly surprised that, that we're seeing what we're seeing. I'm not. I'm, I'm not surprised at all. And it's I'm not, I'm not trying to rag on the players. It, it, it is it is what it is. But offense in the NHL, it all starts. And remember, we used to always talk about Wade Redden. Everyone, what does Wade Redden do? Oh, he makes a really good first pass. First pass. That first yeah. pass, you ask, you ask, you ask any coach, any GM, any hockey guy. It's one of the most important things because if you don't get out of your own zone, well, okay, guess what? You're staying in your own zone. You're going off the glass. And what's Sanderson doing right now? I don't, you guys see a couple of the plays he did when he gets the puck in his own corner. He never rims yeah. the puck unless he has to. He makes a little escape move, gets a little time and space, and makes a nice tape-to-tape -tape pass. And that's why he's off to a pretty good start, because you get all these great forwards, you've made all these great moves. It doesn't matter how good your forwards are. If you don't have defensemen that can get them the puck quickly, cleanly, in transition, you're not going to win. You're not. And, that, and it's always been that way in the NHL. It's always going to be that way. You, you know what? I, I had a great conversation with uh, Jake Sanderson's college coach, uh, Brad Berry, last week. And and I asked him, I, you know, and this was about five or six games into Jake's career. And I said, like, are you surprised that, because he's watching every game on TV, right? I'm like, are you surprised that he's doing what he's doing at the NHL level with what seems to be sort of effortless, right? Like breaking it out. And he told me, he's like, look, we used to go back into the coach's room and we would call <laughs> him the human breakup. He's like, this guy's the human breakout. And and, and I, I love the way Brad explained it to me. He said, look, I look, and I'm sure NHL coaches and Yorkie, you would know this from your time playing as a defenseman, that he said, coaches, we look for three things with a defenseman. Number one, are you willing to pay the price to go back and get the puck when it's dumped in your zone? Are you willing to go and be first on the puck? He said, Jake is always willing to do that. He said, secondly, when you get that puck, yeah. are you able to have the vision and the confidence to make a smart pass to a teammate to start the transition the other way. He said, Jake was a master at that. He said, but thirdly, he said, if those, if if that option isn't there, can you skate the puck out of trouble yourself? He said, he could do it all. He said, 
he said, you don't understand what a gift it is to a coach to have that defenseman who checks all three boxes. And mm -hmm. I think right now, D.J. Smith only has one of them. And, and Thomas Shabbat has that ability. And I, for whatever reason, it's been a little bit yeah. of a flat start for him. But he's got that in his tool bag. I think um, Eric Brandstrom has the ability to have that in his tool bag too. But but when you only have one guy do it, like, that's what you need. You need guys that are consistently willing to or able to break the puck out. And at, at times, you, you don't have that, right? No, for no, it's for for sure. And and what a development job they're doing in North Dakota. When you think of the players Seriously. they're pumping out of there, like somebody needs to go down there and and, uh, and take note and and make a a full study on that and just and just uh, clone it. Yeah, <laughs> like that's what I would be doing if I was another university. Like clone what those guys are doing at Dakota because, wow, they're, they're I, I am so impressed with Sanderson guys. I said I mentioned this earlier. Last night was probably the first game where I saw him face a lot of adversity early on in the game. Things didn't go as well. His way made a couple pretty poor reads off the rush. A lot of times with a young player, he'd be finished for the rest of the game. Uh, mentally, be tough to come back. He, he had a nice bounce back last night. Uh, he, like that one pass he made on the Drew goal. Like not only is oh. this kid breaking out, he, not only is he breaking the puck out like we just talked about, he's making high skill plays on the power play he's making those breakouts and he's still defending pretty good like I, i'm i'm really excited to see where this kid's going to be in a couple of years um and that's the thing with me i i really believe i think ottawa is going to be a really good team i just think people have to be patient you got to wait till docker's ready like this team has to be very careful uh, and not make some moves that are going to jeopardize the future because i think they're Fairly, fairly soon, this is going to be a very good hockey team if they just stick to the plan. Wait till these young defensemen develop, because with Sanderson, Docker's coming, a couple moves here and there, and they can put them with those good forwards. It's going to be a really good team. Uh, Mendez, I got to quickly ask you because I know you got to get going. Um, so the Ottawa Senators released a statement on Friday morning saying, yes, in fact, they are for sale, which comes as no surprise to anybody that's paid attention the last little bit. Um, what do you think plays out here? Ian, do you believe this will be a local group? Do you think it comes from outside uh, with local ownership? Are you getting any sense of where this is going to be at? Yeah, th and this is this is interesting. And I think what's really important, too, to point out from that release, and I'm just going to pull it up here so that uh, I get the um, the wording right. Um, this is critical. There is a, a line in the statement that says a condition of any sale will be that the team remains in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think uh, people need to understand that. There was so much stuff thrown out there over the last, whether it's several months or years, about they're, they're going to move or look out, or, you know. And, and I always felt like that wasn't the case. I always felt like there was multiple groups that were willing to step up by the team and keep them here. Now, if you're asking me what I think would be the ideal scenario, I'd love to see a local ownership group. And I know of at least one, and I think that that would be fantastic because I think with local ownership, there comes an inherent trust, right? Like, they're, hey, I know these names. I know these people. I know these businesses. I know who they are. Um, that's a huge thing. So if you're asking me what I think I, option A would be, it would be that. Um, but I'm curious if this turns into a bidding war. And you know, something that was told to me early in the process was, uh, and I think I wrote this like six or seven months ago, is they want to see that sale price get as close to what Pittsburgh sold for, which was 900 million US. And I think in the past, we would have thought that's that's a, that's a never going to happen. And I don't know. I, I start to think now that that number is going to creep up and up and up. And now you obviously we all saw and had a little bit of fun with the Ryan Reynolds news um, on Wednesday. But it's just a, it's a, 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 gent, a not so gentle reminder that there are a lot of people who are kind of all of a sudden interested in owning an NHL team in Ottawa. So I think it's going to, uh, you know, end up being uh, some sort of consortium. I'd love it if it was local. And I think that the, the key factor in all this is going to be Daniel Alfredson, right? I think uh, Alfredson, I think from what I can gather right now, hasn't aligned himself with any particular group, but I think he's certainly kind of open to, to listening to who might have an offer and, 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 you know, and things of that. And, um, it, 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 it's going to be a fascinating, I think the next six weeks are going to be fascinating because that press release that went out today, I think that was them kind of saying, all right, give us your best offer and go. 
and and here we go. The uh, this is going to be a really fun six weeks here. I'm told by the end of January this should be wrapped up. So I don't know where the the whole John Ruddy lawsuit uh, with the billion dollar thing plays out. And maybe if it gets sold to a local ownership group, that lawsuit goes away. I don't know how that all plays out. But I'm told by the end of January something should be done. Um, if one thing though is we keep saying 900 million US with the Canadian dollar where it's at at some point Ian this doesn't make financial sense there has to be some kind of limit 1.2 1.3 billion dollars is a crazy number when you have to add an arena on top of that right and you know and one thing I was also told a while back too on the arena is they should have had this arena deal done in 2016 like that that's going to be something that haunts them for years that that first LeBreton thing uh you know kind of went off the rails because as people anybody listening to this knows uh, the price of everything has skyrocketed in the last uh, you know over the pandemic right so if you think of the just think of the basic cost of doing a, a build right now so lumber and glass and concrete and all the things that you you know need to to, to create a building well, the price of those things has gone up by like anywhere from 25 to 35, 40% from when they would have built this arena. So for the people that said, oh, you know, you can build an arena for 700 million. Yeah, that might have been true in 2016. I want to know what it's going to cost in 2022. And I think that that number is going to be north of a billion dollars now to, to just to build the arena. So take the, uh, the, the hockey team away from it. Now just focus on LeBreton. I think that's going to be a billion dollar pro uh, project now. Um, so it's 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 going to be fascinating. That now that might be in Canadian dollars too. So that might that you know that that's a, an important distinction. But um, I, I think that you're going to require deep deep pockets here, and it would not surprise me if they're they're going to have to ask for some degree of public uh, you know funding here. And I don't know what the appetite is from the uh, the public, uh, but I don't I don't blame the public if they don't feel like this is at the top of their uh, priority list. So this is this is going to be fascinating. They got to get this all lined up. By basically September of next year, you got you got to go to the NCC by September of next year and say, "Here's our arena plan. It's got sixteen thousand five hundred seats, and here's who's going to build it for us. And this is going to be the cost. And this is the, like it has to be all set. So that that's why I tend to agree with you, Wally. That you know maybe early January to have a deal in principle in place might not be that crazy because you have to have everything lined up for September of next year. So the sale might not close until the summer of next year, but you're going to have virtually everything locked up, I think, in the next two to three months. Well, on top of that, you got to be vetted by the National Hockey League. Um, yeah. So there's that as well. But there is one thing, though. Uh, and Lauer, who's one of the groups in Hamilton, he's already a minority owner of uh, Montreal. Mm -hmm. So he's already been vetted. So they know him. The same with... Um, and I can never remember the f former minority owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins who's in Toronto. Uh, he would be vetted as well being a minority owner. So yep. they do have some of that stuff already played out. Would you guys like to sit in on the vetting process of Ryan Reynolds? <laughs> like like <laughs> Gary Bettman and Ryan Reynolds on a Zoom call. Yeah. Hey, Ian, let's, uh, yeah. let's re rewind here. The Ryan Reynolds interest... I heard it came from some kind of, he was asked a question and he put the uh, interested yeah. thinking emoji up. Is that all it was? No, and no. So, okay. So I, I, exactly. So uh, a Senators fan, I think his name is Casey tweeted at Ryan Reynolds and uh, just off of Ryan Reynolds, he just tweeted something earlier this week about, uh, he, okay. here's the trailer for my new film with Will Ferrell. And in the replies, this random sense fan is like, Hey, by the way, our team is for sale. Come by the team. And Ryan Reynolds decides to respond to the guy. Yeah, yeah, here you go. So, uh, yeah, it's Casey, sense fan. And he's like, hmm, thinking emoji. Well, based on that, uh, <laughs> then People it's Magazine sold. reached out. People Magazine reached out to somebody who they say is close to Reynolds, who said, yeah, absolutely, he is uh, interested in buying the team. So it, it went beyond this, but I think this was absolutely this this tweet right here. That if you're 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 watching us, uh, that tweet right there was absolutely the leaping off point for it. And you know, obviously, I've I've you know made some calls. Or it it appears to be that there's some legitimate interest on his part. I I think he would have to be part of a kind of a group. Yes. I don't think this is going to be him. Uh, but it but look, I I think if nothing else, it adds to uh, 
you know, the, the again, it, it just shows you that there's a list of people that want to buy this team. Like, like I, I hated for years when you would hear people say, well, you're lucky to have a team because there's if you don't keep them here, like they're going to be gone if they're ever put up for, the, for market. I thought that was garbage. I always thought that there was groups ready to step in and, and, and buy the team. So this is, I think yeah. the, the, the rental story is just a, a not so subtle reminder of that. Yeah, a, a, a couple of things too. First on Ryan, uh, Ryan Reynolds, that that's that's awesome. And look how much TSN, Sportsnet, all the major outlets got out of this by replaying this yesterday. Pe people love oh. celebrities. I love celebrity interest. It's a great it's a great story. And I, I'm with you though. I, I, I could see, and I, everyone's hearing the same thing. The group from Hamilton, you have Toronto. I really believe this this team needs local ownership involved. Ottawa is a small town. Yeah. I think I think it's really important. And and there's people here with deep pockets. At the end of the day, I I really believe, and I hope that comes to fruition. I think it would be incredible. Perhaps Ryan Reynolds, if if it is in fact true, jumps in as a small stake and just the name power, the social media influence. It'd be, it'd be great for this franchise. It'd be, it'd be really cool. But um, it, it must have been a slow news day too. That 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 is incredible how that happens. Off one little question from a from a fan, and uh, to play devil's advocate, sure he didn't have to respond, but. After that, what's he going to say? Ah, no, I'm not interested. I, I don't want the Ottawa Senator. Of course he's going to say yeah. yes, whether he doesn't or whether he doesn't, because, hey, it's it's good for the brand, right? It's, you always got to be thinking about the brand, and the, and the more people that love you, the better. But, uh, hey, I got to admit, too, I'm a, I'm a Ryan Reynolds fan as well, and uh, I'd, be, I'd be pretty psyched to see it, too. He, he's one of those, like, and it's very rare to find in, in a more polarizing society, uh, like a universally loved person, but he's pretty yeah. darn close, right? You, you don't really run yeah. into anybody who's like, I don't like Ryan Reynolds. Like this guy is like loved by everybody, right? And and he just um, I know I know just, a guy he, like that, Ian. I know a guy like that. Alfie? Mendez is, kind this is going of, back to Alfie. Mendez 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 does anybody not like Mendez? Oh this is not the this is not the place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yes, there are a few. Uh, there's a couple. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you not like this guy. Uh, oh. I, okay, so uh, aside from Ryan Reynolds, I'm going to ask both of you, if you had a choice to pick one person, celebrity with Ottawa ties to own or Ooh. be part of the Ottawa Senators, who would you pick? Uh, Ian? Okay, so you have the is the is the list you coming the up list? on the screen for the viewers? Or yeah, okay. here we go. There okay. we go. Okay. So you so got Tom Cruise, Dan question. Aykroyd, Alanis Morissette, Paul Anka, Avril Lavigne, Tom Green, Sandra O, oh, and Annie Murphy. Okay, so cards on the table. I mean, I really loved Shit's Creek. Like, thought it was a great show. I had so Annie Murphy has what's the Ottawa connection? I had no idea. She's from I, she's from Ottawa. She is, yeah. I, I had no idea. Honestly, I have no. I I had no idea. As well, an audible guy, is what I like to say when you come to our show. You take away a little bit of no, extra knowledge. Well, yep. I, I don't know. I feel like as a community, we're not doing enough to pump the fact that she's got Ottawa ties. Then is 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 my point? Because I feel like she was on the first list I had of show guests. Was Annie Murphy? Yep. And. Well, I haven't way, reached out because I don't know how yet, but. Well, apparently if you just start tweeting at celebrities, they respond. If we've learned anything from this <laughs> week, it, yeah. so. Maybe, maybe hey, that's just answer the question. Do. Don't put me down <laughs> for Annie Murphy because I just want to know, like, where, like, what's your, did you grow up in Gloucester? Like, I just want to know, like, what, what's this connection? <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a huge fan uh, of her. Like on this list, I would be probably the biggest fan of her. So yeah, put me down, put me down for that. Um, I, 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 Tom uh, Cruise. Reading. Where's Where's Tom Cruise's uh, Ottawa connection? He lived here he for a bit. Bar, His he dad grew up in Barhaven. Yeah, <laughs> Barhaven, old Barhaven. That's yeah. all that was there. No, no. He he briefly lived in Ottawa, right? Uh, Tom Cruise at one point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's true. Kind you know, of like Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds yeah. briefly lived in Ottawa when he was thirteen. Uh, yeah. Mendez. Annie yep. Murphy, both her parents were teachers. She attended Elmwood School 
Um, and then she enrolled at Queens for a year before getting a degree in theater at Concordia University. Okay. So she did. She grew up in Ottawa then. She grew up in Ottawa. We, we need to get a hold of the marketing department for the city of Ottawa and say, where, what have you been doing here? Like, you got to be pumping this story out. Like, if I don't yeah. know that she's from here, then somebody has dropped the ball in the PR department. <laughs> That's all. Um, so, Yorkie, I'm, right, I'm putting you down for Tom Cruise, or are you changing? No, I'm not a Scientology guy. I can't do it. I'm going to go with uh, <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not offending anybody with that comment, by the way. Uh, I'm um, sure you are. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd, come on. Blues Brothers, Saturday Night Live, Ghostbusters. This guy, uh, Dan Aykroyd, for me, it's a no-brainer. He's uh, love to see him involved. He's a guy that's timeless. Um, yeah. Original SNL uh, cast member as well, guys, don't forget. So, Aykroyd. I'm, I'm taking Tom Cruise all day for, for the simple fact that he would have this. He's trying to save the Scientology with. crowd now. While he's trying to bring them back, <laughs> you lost uh, your team. While he's bringing them back, someday, Mendez, you and I will tell the day we walked by the Scientology Church in New York yeah. that story. Yeah, um, I, I'm Tom Cruise because that'll be like there'd be fighter jet stuff around. You would you'd never know what's about to happen if he was here. I think it'd be awesome. So you're you're yeah. if I'm just making this, clear, I, I just wanted some clarification on this. Yeah. You're advocating for more instability and uncertainty around the team. With, with you never know what's going to happen. Enough. Yeah. I want stability. I want. I don't want the Fine. unknown. Okay? I, I I want some action. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Well, Tom Cruise it is because I think he's the biggest blockbuster name on the list. And Ryan Reynolds is just too nice. Everybody likes him. I mean, a polarizing guy. Yeah, like Cruz is pretty polarizing. <laughs> he can have Oprah here. How, how come the Biebs didn't make the list? Because remember, Justin Bieber kicked the tires on Ottawa. Because yeah, he's the Leafs guy. He's the Leafs guy. He and he well, and Austin you, Matthews what, are too tight. You, yeah, but what the delicious irony of Justin Bieber owns the Senators, and guess what? Austin Matthews is a UFA in a couple of years. No. Bring him in. No. 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 Once you're a Leaf, we don't, I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> okay. That, that's the end of Connor Brown joining your podcast then. Uh, I feel bad Jason for Connor Spetsa. Brown, by the way. No, but Spets was a send down. before. I'll tell, you, I'll, t I'll tell you guys a funny story about the Leafs and my mother. Bless her heart. She's not, she's not around anymore. <laughs> So my my last year in Ottawa, uh, I was represented by Pat Morris, and I thought Pat calls me right before the playoffs, and he's like, "Toronto's going to sign you for four years." And I don't want to tell my mom because she hates the Leafs. So finally, I tell my mom, "I'm like, mom, there's a chance I might go to the Leafs," and she's like, "Jason, I don't know if I'll be able to watch you play hockey." <laughs> and this is my mother who has never missed one of my games in in, in her life. But she grew up a diehard Habs fan. But that's the way it is with that generation. It's either it was Montreal or Toronto. And she hated the Toronto Maple Leafs to the core so much that she wouldn't even watch her own son if he got if he had signed with Toronto. I wouldn't guys, it, it obviously didn't happen. We got swept uh, four straight by the by the Leafs in the playoffs and things didn't go as the way they were supposed to. Uh, so but it would you're it would have been interesting. You're telling me you were on the verge of signing with Toronto, a long-term deal. Then yes. they see you in a playoff series, and they're like, no, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Two things happened. Two things happened. That, and they signed Alexander McGillney. You remember when McGillney signed with the Leafs? That kind of yeah. came out of nowhere, and he signed for, like, I think it was $5 million. And then my agent calls me. He's like, yeah, Toronto's done. They're out of they're not spending anymore, so I ended up going to Anaheim. But I, I just, I always think back, if I would have went, what would my poor mother have done with me playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs? Like, it would it would have drove her crazy. She would have come around. Wow. 
I don't know, man. The Toronto Maple Leaf Ottawa thing is it's pretty cut and dry. Like you, it's, you know, I remember, it's, I remember um, Scott Saverin's dad, and I'm, and I think it's Dave. Uh, uh, I remember he phoned into the, we were Lever Sage and I had this heated debate on the radio on this exact topic. And as people people listen to uh, this might know, Lee and I are both Dallas Cowboys fans. And I said, if my child uh, was drafted in the NFL and got drafted by like Philadelphia, I would start cheering for the Eagles because my kid plays for that team. Lee's like, I would never in a million years. I'm like, even if your kid is playing, he's like, nope, I would cheer against them. <laughs> we were having this debate. Yeah. And Scott, Scott Sabrin's dad was listening on the radio. This is when Scott was up with yeah. Ottawa. And he actually phoned in and said, hey, it's Dave Sabrin. And I want yeah. you to know, I grew up, I have been the biggest Montreal Canadiens fan my entire life. You need to understand, huge Habs fan through and through. Yeah. The minute Scott joined Ottawa, all out the window. I cheer for my kid. So I think your mom would have come around. I think your mom would have come around. Would've, it would have took It would have took a while. It wouldn't have happened overnight. It would have took a while. I'll tell you that. I know my mom. She is. It's just, it, it, it's, it's, it's a deep, deep hatred, Ian. Oh, man. And as much as I know earlier I mentioned I'd love to be a fly on the wall for the Gary Bettman vetting, uh, uh, Gary Bettman vetting <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. I think I'd rather, Wally, I'd rather have been a fly on the wall. It's the Maple Leafs, uh, you know, war room in the summer of 2001. And they're like, should we sign Jason York or Alex McGilney? <laughs> Would be good. Well, Would be good. <laughs> who knows? It didn't work out for them. They didn't win. Yeah, exactly. But and by the way, McGillney should be in the Hall of Fame. That's another discussion for that. That guy's un unbelievable player. Unbelievable yep. player. Do you? Agreed. How's he not yeah, in the Hall? Agreed. Seventy six goals, right? He's There's a few of them. Seventy six goals the one year. Yeah. This is yeah. just to just about the Hall of Fame real quick here, and I I, I tend to agree with you on McGillney because I think there was a short period of time where he was arguably one of the best players in the game. There yep. was a there was a period, and I remember playing against McGillney, and and he was, if not the best, most dynamic for sure. Um, and anytime you can say that about a player, when you are the best in the business or close to it, that's Hall of Fame credentials, in my opinion. Yeah, so, look, he's got multiple fifty goal seasons. One with um, yeah. uh, one with Buffalo as a seventy six goals. Later with Vancouver, and then the year I don't have his stats in front of me, but. He was a huge part of the Devils team that won the Stanley Cup in 2000. Like, he was a key yeah, guy. Yeah, he was. In 40 like, yeah. he did everything. It's the weirdest thing, like, how he's not in the Hall of Fame. It's uh, do you, do you guys, a... Do you guys ever hear that? Do you guys ever hear the Alexander McGillney, Mike Keenan story? No. Oh, this is great. We need to right now. We got time, we got time, we got time for this, Wally? Yeah. So... McGillney is playing for the Vancouver Canucks and Keenan's the coach at the time. They're losing. Keenan comes in between periods, doing his Mike Keenan stuff, yelling at the guys. And McGillney's not having a great game. He looks at Alex and he's just, you're brutal. You got to start working. You can't get by on skill. And he's just giving it to McGillney in front of the team. McGillney looks up at him and he's like, Mike, do you think I give a fuck what you say? He goes, the Russian mob tried to kill my family. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> like, like, and and, I'm, and that's not saying that lately. Back then, when when the Russian players came over to to North America, I remember I was in Detroit with Fedorov. It was serious. So all of a sudden, Keenan looks at McGillney and just goes on to the next guy. Like, how's that for a little bit of a back? You know what? I don't care what you say. I got to deal with the Russian mob. Yeah, I, like Alex oh, wow. risked honestly risked his life. He was a teenager yeah. when he came. I think he defected during like a, it was like a Max Milk tournament, a tournament. as a kid. He yeah. he defected. You're right. This guy th again to me. That's why. How is he not in the Hall of Fame? Like this guy, straight up risked his life to come over here, puts up yep. Hall of Fame numbers, and everyone's like, well, I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer. Like, what else does he have to do? I think it's I think it's I, because I he pl like he played on a lot of teams, right? And when you think of Alexander McGillney, which team do you think of? I mean, I, I think I, I think of him in, in Buffalo, but 
you know, he played in Vancouver and yeah, Toronto and New Jersey. But I mean, that yeah. didn't that didn't hurt like uh, uh, you know Mark no, Recchi. When you think of Mark, where do you think of him? Like all over the place, right? Yeah. No, I, I'm just trying yeah. to think of maybe one reason while they're kind of slighting he, him. Like, you know what? I think I figured it out. Let's look it up. Is Mike Keenan on the Hall of Fame selection committee? Oh, maybe he's on <laughs> there and he's maybe that's why. Still picking no. back, back to him. Yeah. Uh... Listen, gentlemen, uh, you're both Hall of Famers to me, uh, but we got to get out of here. So, uh, as always, thanks for uh, joining us and uh, tuning in to another edition of Coming In Hot, brought to you by Renfrew Pro Tape. Go to RenfrewPro.com uh, for all your latest and check them out at all the local retailers. They're the ones with the green core. See you next time, boys.